There cannot be a dollars and cents value placed in reading a great book that has the person of Jesus Christ at the core of the content of that book. I just got done reading such a book. Today on Keeping It Real will be the first half of an interview I did with the author of that book. The author is Frank Viola, and the book is entitled 48 Laws of Spiritual Power. So stay tuned for part one of my interview with Frank Viola. All right, and welcome to another episode of Keeping It Real. I'm your host, Ali G, and we are in for a special treat today as I have Frankie V on the podcast today, better known as Frank Viola. I can tell you who he's not. He is not the former pitcher of the Minnesota Twins from a number of years ago. So he's not that former Major League Baseball pitcher, but he is. A lot of other things. Let me tell you, he is a conference speaker, blogger, best-selling author. He helps serious followers of Jesus know their Lord more deeply so that they can experience real transformation and make a lasting impact. Frank's blog can be found on frankviola.org. It is regularly ranked in the top five of all Christian blogs on the web. And his podcast, Christ is All, has ranked number one in Canada and number two here in the States on iTunes. His Insurgents podcast features discussions with his conversation partners on the explosive gospel of the kingdom. Uh, his Insurgents podcast in particular is one that I have binged, listened to, and have greatly enjoyed. And he has a new book out. It released a few months ago called The 48 Laws of Spiritual Power. And I have read it twice already. I feel like I could read it another 53 times and it not get old, just like his other works that I've read. It just tremendously powerful and impactful. Frank, thanks for being on the Keeping It Real podcast today. How are you doing and how have the reviews gone so far regarding the new book? Well, thanks so much for the kind introduction. As I told you before, when you get to the 54th read of the book, then it starts to get really lame and really dry. So you might want to just stop uh, after you get to 53. I still don't <laughs> think that would happen, but uh, that, that's fair enough that you want to lay that out there. <laughs> just a warning yeah, uh, for the kids. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, we, we definitely want to warn the kids. Yeah. <laughs> don't read this book too much. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's uh, it's been great. The reviews have been super encouraging to me. Um, it's been a blessing to see that the book is connecting and resonating with many, many people, and many are receiving value from it. And that's the whole reason to write a book. It's not an easy thing to write a book and put it out into the world. And when you do so, you never know if it's going to connect with anyone. So I'm very grateful for the reviews. They've been super encouraging. Well, that's always awesome to hear. You know, I just get excited when I know God is using something to shake me on the inside. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned how there's so much shallow activity going on in the name of Jesus Christ in our day. And you've cited in your work uh, how it has been going on for a long time. And we didn't get here overnight. And where the church is at today, you know, is not in a very healthy spot by and large. Mm -hmm. Um, so a book like this is definitely impactful and I recommend it to anyone, but especially for folks that are looking for something more, looking to move beyond superficial. Frank, I got to ask you this, uh, because this really, I, I can't wrap my mind around this. Okay. How did you find the time to write this thing <laughs> since you release a podcast episode Every week on not one, but two different podcasts, you write a blog article every Thursday, you travel and speak, and you run the Deeper Christian Life Network. I mean, how do you find the time to piece this thing together? Because this isn't a situation, I don't think, at least, it does, certainly doesn't sound that way, where a publisher's coming to you and going, hey, what you, what do you think about writing a book like this? You know, I mean, this is something, as you mentioned, has been in the making for a long, long time, and you're doing it at the same time you're exhausting yourself in all of these other uh, ministry uh, platforms and venues. How, mm -hmm. how, where do you get the time for that? 
Well, the simple answer is that my wife writes all my books and I have two angels that do everything else. No, I wish I could joke, folks. That was a joke, folks. I wish I could. I wish I could say that. I find the answer to that question perplexing myself, because when I look at the amount of productivity and work that I put out every single week, I'm not sure exactly how I do it myself. Now, I'll come right around and say this, that a number of years ago, a lot of people were asking me that same question, you know, how do you put out all this work in such a short period of time? And I sat down for a number of weeks, several months, actually, to try to distill an answer to that question. And what ended up happening is I ended up putting out a course called Prolific, (laughs) which has all of my shortcuts, all of my rhythms, all of my strategies on how I am productive, as productive as I can be. Now, I'm not one of these productivity gurus, Mm -hmm. but what I have created, I have either picked up from other people and or adapted to my own personality, my own sleep cycles, etc. So I have a way of working where I get an awful lot done in a short period of time. But partly it's because I work in the mornings when I have the most energy. I use a lot of shortcuts and a lot of strategies that are just like breathing to me now. You know, they're second wow. nature. And the other thing is I've learned the power of the plod which is accumulating little bits of uh, productivity over a period of time, it adds up. It's the power of incremental change. And so that has worked out really well in my own life. And uh, again, if anybody's interested, uh, they can go to my site, frankverola.org. They can look at courses and they'll see the prolific course, which really is detailed and very extensive. So, yeah, it's a it's a legitimate question. It's an interesting question, and I'm still baffled by the grace the Lord has given me to be able to accomplish so much in a short space. Well, it kind of sounds like it, Frank, that uh, that you would can't help but to look back and go, this is all God. I mean, God had to have done this. And I think you cite that in uh, 48 Laws of Spiritual Power as well. That's how we, we know something for sure is of the Lord, when we're able to look back and go, there's no way I could have done that. <laughs> so mm-hmm. yeah. now let's get into some of the nuts and bolts of the book. And I, I just cannot wait to conversate with you now as we kind of jump in or dive into this. Uh, one of the things I love about your books, and it certainly includes uh, this book, 48 Laws of Spiritual Power, is the the chapters, all 48, and then there's some codas at the end, which we're going to get into as well. All of the chapters are relatively short. They are three, four, or five pages long. And I've heard you mention on several occasions that you are a big fan of short chapters. So am I. The 48 chapters in the codas at the end usually are about four or five pages long. Um, you're such a fan of short chapters. And it really brings out each of the laws that you bring to the forefront through this book. I think it's such a clear, easy to read way. It's understandable. I feel like I could hand this to my 13 year old daughter and she could understand a lot of it. Yeah. Um, how is it that seemingly so many Christians embrace the cross that is death to self at the time when they accepted the Lord, but forget largely and largely neglect the cross for most of their Christian lives? Well, you're hitting on. Law number 19, develop an instinct for the cross. And it's a great question. Um, And I'm glad you asked it because I do want to riff on this a bit. If I were to speak in front of 100 ministers today from all different denominations and movements, and I said, I want to talk to you today about the cross of Jesus Christ. I would dare say that the vast majority of them would think that I'm going to talk about the atoning death, the sacrificial death of Christ, right? what he did in his own death. I think very few of them would think or would assume or their minds would jump to, he's going to talk about self-denial. He's going to talk about all the places in the Gospels where Jesus said, if you don't take up your cross, you cannot follow me. Mm -hmm. 
if anybody listening to this would just do a study, it's so easy now. You can pull up a Bible program uh, online. Many different uh, websites have that. And you just search the word cross in the Gospels. You're going to find that when it came off the lips of Jesus Christ, he was mainly talking about the principle of the cross, dying to self, laying your life down, losing, letting go. And there are many, many passages about this where he is talking about this principle. I think that when most people come to Christ, they believe on Christ, they repent and trust in him, they surrender their lives to him, they are given a little bit of teaching, depending on what tribe of Christianity they have been exposed to, right. on surrender, self-surrender, right? So, okay, I'm surrendering my life to Jesus. He's Lord, and I'm submitting to his lordship, or I'm making him Lord, as, as some people uh, use the phrase. But after that, a message on the cross, meaning the bearing of the cross, is very rare in the Christian world, even among the evangelicals, even among the charismatics. It's very rare to hear somebody speak for 45 minutes or longer on the cross of Jesus Christ, not talking about his atoning death, but talking about all the places where he is talking about or speaking about the principle of the cross and bidding you and I to die upon it. It's all over Paul's epistles as well. You know, I die right. daily. Yes. It is through death that we enter into life, bearing about in my body the marks of Jesus Christ. So it's all over the New Testament, and yet it's very rarely preached today. And unless a person has experienced it, they can't preach it, at least not in power, not where it's going to have an impact. And so I think the reason is, number one, it's rarely preached, and two, it's rarely preached because very few experience it, <laughs> you know, walk in it. And therefore, it's not proclaimed much. The other thing about it is, uh, Ali, the cross is the easiest thing to forget. Mm. You know, even if you hear messages on the cross of Christ, and I preach on it quite frequently, because it's so easy to forget, we need to be reminded. So there is the chapter in the book, Law 19, Develop an Instinct of the Cross, and that's my introduction on the principle of the cross of Jesus Christ, which is vital for living the Christian life, as well as any kind of ministry that's going to have impact. Well, I appreciate you, your feedback and elaborating on that. And Frank, as you were going into riffing on that, you know, as you say, uh, I my, my mind traveled back uh, a number of years when um, I was getting ready to go to seminary and I was mm. studying to enter into pastoral ministry. And I was looking for a you know, quote unquote, church to go to. And down in Virginia, churches, in case, you know, people uh, here in the local listening area where I'm at here in Pennsylvania and PA, churches are not nearly as frequent as down in, in the Bible Belt. Churches are, and, and I'm talking specifically on institutional churches, they are more numerous than gas stations. And uh, I had attended a church and a couple of, you know, elders did their you know, Christian duty of coming to visit me to see what I thought of the church service that I was in. And they went on for at least 20 minutes to talk uh, a lot <laughs> extensively about the pastor and how great he was. Mm. And even in my, and I had only become a Christian a couple of years because I didn't get saved till I was 20, almost 21. And and the Lord saved me from out of a really, really dark, dark place, uh, serious rock bottom. And had just inspired me and given me so much life. And here I was just ready to take the world by storm for Christ. And, and little did I know how many learning pains and growing pains there would be along the way, including back at those days. But as these gentlemen were at the door and speaking up about the pastor, I finally said, and listen, I didn't come across your, any of your writings yet. I, did, I didn't know you from Adam. I finally said, uh, you know, I'm just curious. You've been talking a lot about the pastor. Is Jesus there? And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, Jesus is there. Yeah, right, right. And they talk about Jesus for maybe about two minutes, and they would be back on the pastor again. And I'm like, oh, all right, listen, I didn't mean to be disrespectful, but I got to go. So, mm -hmm. But I go on that, or my mind went back to that, because even though I was immature in a lot of ways in the Lord, I'd only been a Christian a couple of years, which is a spiritual day at least when you look at it from certainly a time element, mm -hmm. um, there was something 
that God was doing in my life, even in those very early days, that told me there's something off, there's something missing in Christendom of today, whether if it's back at that time or before or certainly now, um, you know, because I've come across, uh, you know, a, a number of things in the scriptures. And then in two, shortly after 2008, I came across this book called Pagan Christianity. I think you've heard of it. Mm-hmm. And um, it absolutely rocked me to the core. And it gave me, as I believe you mentioned on a podcast episode before, it gave me, and as you uh, made mention of, it gave a number of your readers permission to feel the way they have been feeling for a while. Mm -hmm. And then you follow it up with Reimagining Church, which was the sequel to that, which was equally as riveting and impactful. And so to expound on what you were talking about, and how it is the easiest thing to forget the cross. I think it's kind of wired in the way how the church by and large has been functioning for so long. It's in the shallow DNA of modern day Christendom. Would that, would that be a fair assessment, Frank? I can't refute that. I don't have a disagreement with that. Yeah, I think that by and large, that's the case. Now, there's always exceptions. Sure. But thankfully, hopefully, you know, the book and uh, there are some messages, too, on the podcasts that go into this in a lot more detail. But, yeah, we are all in need of receiving ministry on the cross of Christ, the bearing of it, the laying our lives down on it, etc., we're in need of reminders, you know, after we have been exposed to that initial message because it's so easy to forget. So there's another spiritual law, guarding against self-righteousness. Pride is another spiritual law of the book. And it's something that I've struggled with, Frank, admittedly. Mm -hmm. How does one stay on the charted Christ-led divine path of ministry, which carries divine strength and authority? And not falling into that realm of self-righteousness. Well, I will say to you that if God is using you in any capacity or he's gifted you in any way, self-righteousness will, in fact, be a temptation. Uh And so in my experience and in my observation, the antidote to this partly is out of our control. Um, The other part is well within our control. Here's the antidote. Brick walls, roadblocks head-on collisions, broadsides. In other words, it is God allowing circumstances and even arranging some of those circumstances to break us, to humble us. Mm. And it's our response to those circumstances that will determine if we're going to avoid self-righteousness or if we're going to keep walking in it or even embrace it. So, for example, we can think of many stories of people in the Bible as well as after it was written whom God used, but they were a little bit too puffed up (laughs) and something happened in their life that knocked them down a few pegs. Yeah, And so it is the circumstances of the Lord. Now, part of the antidote as well is to guard against it, to recognize it's a real thing, that anytime we are being used to remind ourselves or have others remind us that we're simply the pencil in the artist's hand, we are not the one who's doing it, all right? We have a part to play, but without the great artist, we, the pencil, are virtually nothing. And when self-righteousness begins to take root, the person who is allowing that to happen has lost sight of that. They think that they are something special rather than an instrument like a pencil. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which doesn't mean a whole lot. No, it doesn't. What's important is who's using it, right? Yeah, so. right. And I, and I love the illustration of the pencil. Again, that's something that Pretty much, I think everybody could follow. (laughs) Yeah, you talk about slowing our minds down, Frank. Uh, Slowing our minds down and putting away all distractions for the sake of beholding the Lord. What practical steps can one take so that this can become a reality, particularly for someone that may feel greatly overwhelmed with busyness? I cite again, especially here in the West, you cite the West a lot of times and how we are susceptible to a lot of things that are not 
spiritually healthy. Mm -hmm. So to have spiritual power, how can we slow our minds down and put off those distractions? Well, I really would need nine weeks to get into this deep. <laughs> Seriously. And I have some courses that, that do just that, uh, master classes and courses. But I guess, you know, for the purposes of a podcast episode, one of the things that really helps, especially if you have a mind that is like an uncaged monkey on amphetamines, <laughs> is to first turn to the Lord in the morning because you're your first waking moments are the time where your mind is not moving as quickly. Mm. So developing a habit of turning your attention, your mind, your heart, your spirit to him. That's a great practical word. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as you wake up. And this is something that requires reminding because, you know, if you've not built it as a habit in your life, you'll forget. The other thing is to concentrate on your breath. Now, this is interesting because non-Christians have picked this up, but it's really a biblical practice. Interestingly, the word breath, our English term breath in both Hebrew and in Greek is spirit. And so the term Holy Spirit, the Greek word means breath and the Hebrew word means breath. So you could say he's the holy breath. Oh, he's the wow. breath of yeah. God. Yeah. Wow. So when we are breathing, it is a tangible, experiential, visible, visceral reminder that Jesus Christ dwells in us by the Spirit of God. And so we can breathe in such a way where we are recognizing that the author of life lives in us. Mm. And so we're putting our mind on him as we breathe in and breathe out. So that's a basic thing that a Christian can learn how to do. There's nothing weird about it. There's nothing strange about it. If you do a study in both Old and New Testament on the breath, just remember the key moment. One of the key moments in the gospel story is when Jesus in his resurrected state breathed into the apostles. Yeah. And he entered into them by the Holy Spirit. Well, we have that breath in us, the mm. holy breath of God. And so to, to set our mind on that breath, recognizing with full intentionality that this is the life of God in me. This represents the life of God in me. You know, God breathed into Adam's nostrils and he became a living soul. So there's just a lot about the breath. And so those are just two simple things. But there is a course on my website called Living by the Indwelling Life of Christ, which goes into this a lot more. Mm -hmm. If people are interested, and then also on the Deeper Christian Life Network, I have a master class called Beautiful Pursuit, and it's all about knowing the Lord in a very practical way, many different practical handles, practical action steps that we can take to interact with the Lord, to fellowship and commune with Him in ways that go beyond just simply reading the Bible in an intellectual way and praying prayers that are kind of dead, wooden, and formal. There was a lot of helpful uh, information there that I believe will, you know, could help out just a ton of people. That concludes part one of my interview with Frank Viola. Please stay tuned for part two on the next episode. 